We'll ask the Lord to speak to us today about prayer from Isaiah chapter 64. And as we prepare to open God's word, um, a short prayer to ask God to help us. Let's pray. Living God, may your word be our rule. May your spirit be our teacher. May your great glory be our supreme concern through Jesus Christ, our only Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Prayer. One question, is prayer easy or is prayer hard? Is prayer easy or is prayer hard? I won't ask you to raise your hand, but lock in your answer in your mind. Is prayer easy or is prayer hard? And I'll give you the answer. Many times, many times actually, I've said things from this pulpit that have made various of you very angry and turned you for a minute or two into my enemy, and that's okay. I can live with that. I'm in, at least in the first 60 seconds of this sermon, I can make you all my friends because no matter how you answered, you're right. <laughs> prayer is easy and prayer is hard. Power and perseverance in prayer are hard. Persistence, endurance, don't you think that to be simple but very true about it, one of the most important facets of the Christian life is to keep showing up. To keep showing up. To keep coming to church. To stay in ABF even when the relationships get a little scratchy. To stay in the word even when it seems dry and to show up before the Lord in prayer, even when you don't feel like it. Perseverance and power in prayer come together. It is, it is the case that we often think, why is there so much evil in the world? And it's often the case that that becomes very located in our own life. Why is there so much suffering and difficulty in my own life? Isaiah 64 is one of the most passionate and powerful prayers, I think, in all the Old Testament. And I wanna show you this morning how the perseverance in prayer in Isaiah 64 is actually what swings the entire end of the book of Isaiah in chapter 62, 63, and 64, and then in 65 and 66. The powerful, persevering prayer in Isaiah 64 swings this entire section of Isaiah right through the end. Look at Isaiah 62, and you'll see God's determination to bless his people. Isaiah 62, verse 1. God says, 62.1, For Zion's sake I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations will see your righteousness. All the kings will see your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You will be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord, a royal diadem in the hand of God. You shall no more be termed forsaken. And your land will no more be termed desolate, but you'll be called my delight is in her and your land married for the Lord delights in you and your land shall be married as a young man marries a one young woman. So shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Prayer is easy because God has promised to bless us God has promised to bless every believer. And yet prayer is hard because we go through seasons where we're waiting for that promised blessing and it hasn't landed yet. Not only is God determined to bless his people, but Isaiah 63 tells us that God is determined to judge his enemies and God is determined to judge the enemies of his people. Look at 63 verse one. Who is this? who comes from Edom in crimson garments from Bosra. He who is splendid in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red 
and your garments like his who treads in the winepress. I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger, trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood splattered my garments and stained all my apparel, for the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption had come. I looked, there was no one to help. I was appalled, there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought me salvation, and my wrath upheld me. I trampled I trampled down the peoples in my anger. I made them drunk in my wrath and I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. Church, we see evil and injustice in our nation, in our world. We experience evil and injustice and pain in our own lives. And we cry out to God, how long? That's a prayer, how long? Is it easy to cry out to God, how long? Yes. Is it hard and difficult to keep crying out to God? How long? Yes. God's determined to bless his people. God's determined to judge his enemies. And then Isaiah 63, 7, all the way through the end of Isaiah 64 is our prayer. Praising God for all of his promises to bless us. Praising God for all of his promises to judge our enemies. And pleading for God to forgive us because we know that we ourselves have sinned. And Isaiah 64, really verses uh, 5 through 12 will be our text today, but let's read Isaiah 64. It says, how's this for a prayer? 64, 1. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. The mountains might quake at your presence. And when fire kindles brushwood, the fire causes water to boil and make your name known to your adversaries that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things that we didn't look for, you came down and the mountains quaked at your presence. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for him. You meet him who joyfully works righteousness. Those who remember you in your ways. Behold, you were angry. We sinned. In our sins, we have been a long time. And shall we be saved? We have all become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf. And our iniquities like the wind take us away. There's no one who calls upon your name, who rouses himself to take hold of you. You've hidden your face from us. You've made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. But now, O oh Lord, you are our father. We're the clay. You're the potter. We're the work of your hand. So be not so terribly angry, O oh Lord, and remember not iniquity forever. Behold, please look. We are all your people. Your holy cities have become a wilderness. Zion has become a wilderness. Jerusalem, a desolation. Our holy and beautiful house where our fathers praise you has been burned by fire. And all our pleasant places have become ruins. Will you restrain yourself at these things, O Lord? Will you keep silent and afflict us so terribly? You see the power you see the perseverance and you see the passion in that prayer. We know we've blown it, but we know we're still your people. We know we deserve judgment and we're getting it, but we know that you forgive our sin ultimately in Christ and we're still your people. So how long, oh Lord? And this prayer from taking the promises to bless in 62, the promises to judge and curse in 63, this prayer in 64 leads us into Isaiah 65 and 66, which is God's glorious plan to answer the prayers of his faithful believing women and men and fulfill all of his promises in judgment and salvation. See what he says in 65, 1 and 2. I was ready to be sought by those who didn't ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who didn't seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, <clears throat> to a nation that was not even called by my name. I spread out my hands all day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that's not good, following their own devices. You see the patience of God. As if God himself is pleading with sinners to repent. Repent. And then you see God's movement in the life of his people <clears throat> and to judge iniquity in 65, <clears throat> pick it up in verse six. 
Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. I will indeed repay you into your lap, both your iniquities and your father's iniquities together, says the Lord, because they made offspring on the mountains and insulted me on the hills. I'll measure into their lap payment for their former deeds. Thus says the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster and they say, don't destroy it, there's still a blessing in it, so I will do for my servant's sake and not destroy them all. There's the remnant, there's the remnant. I will bring forth offspring from Jacob and from Judah, possessors of my mountains. My chosen shall possess it and my servants shall dwell there. And we won't read it all, but just look at verse 17 of 65. This is God's great answer to our prayers. This is God's great glorious plan. Verse 17, behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. And the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. You see, God's gonna rejoice over Jerusalem and be glad in his people. And there'll be no more weeping, no more crying of distress. So our text today is this prayer in verses really four through 12 of Isaiah 64. And this prayer is the, the swing from, from, the, from, from the rest of the book of Isaiah to bring us to the conclusion in 65 and 66 where God answers these prayers and God glorifies himself in the salvation of his people. Isaiah 64 verse five is the promise of salvation. You meet him who joyfully works righteousness. Those who remember you in your ways, behold, you were angry and we sinned. In our sins, we've been a long time and shall we be saved? An alternate translation, there's, to, to make it simplistic, there's no question mark in the Hebrew language. <clears throat> and this could be translated, we have been so long in our sins, but we shall still be saved. It could be a statement. Here it's translated as a question, shall we be saved? But I believe it's a question that, that expects a positive answer because we know from Isaiah 53 that God has taken the iniquities of his people upon the suffering servant, the son of God. We know this from the overall context of Isaiah that there is an expectation of salvation. Though we have sinned and we don't deserve it, the suffering servant took what he did not deserve so that he could give us his righteousness. So even this prayer in confessing sin pleads God's faithfulness. <clears throat> this prayer is really with the whole tenor of the old covenant <clears throat> of everything that the Old Testament teaches about the law of God, obeying the law, bringing a blessing and disobeying the law, bringing consequences. If we forsake the law, God visits our transgressions with his rod, but in his loving kindness, he'll ultimately save Israel. That's really, the, that's really the whole movement of the Old Testament is that God gives his kids a law. And he says, I give you this law because I love you and I want you to walk in peace. But as rebellious children, we break the law. And so God, as a faithful father, brings the rod of his discipline. That's why they say, even the house where our fathers used to worship, it's burned in fire. This was the, the, the awesome discipline of the exile. And yet still we are pleading that we know we're still your kids. Because you're our father, you gave us your love. Because you're our father, you gave us your law. And because you're our father, you're not gonna abandon us even though we've sinned. This is why prayer is easy because God is our father. And this is why prayer is hard because our sin confuses us. In verses six, seven, or yes, yeah, six and seven is one of Isaiah's most picturesque teachings about human sin. This is that famous verse that even our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. If you look at verse six, if you look at verse six with me, church, you will see the word like four times. Why is that? Because good teaching always has a lot of likes in it. That's the way you teach. You teach by comparing one thing to another. Metaphor is the big word for it, encompassing the whole thing. 
simile is the word for it, where you use like or as, but good teaching always has a lot of likes in it. Good Bible teaching has a lot of likes in it. Jesus' teaching is filled with comparisons and metaphors and pictures and likes. What are the likes in verse six in service of? He uses four of them, and they're all trying to drill down on the same truth that you wouldn't understand without the likes. And what is it? We become like one who's unclean. Our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Each of the four likes is teaching you about how bad you are, how sinful you are, what your sin is like. It's, it's not meant for you to have four more ways to compare the loser down the row from you. It's te teaching you about your own sin. Why? Think about this. You ought to think about this more than you do. Why would you need not just one or two or three, but four different likes to get you to see your own sin? Why would that be? I wonder why that would be. Would that be because the first, the second, the third, they always get rebuffed? Yeah, I, I know, God, that the people who sit in that section are really messed up, but our section's good. Yeah, I know, God, that the people who watch that news channel are crazy, but I watch the right news channel. Like, whatever it is, we always pop it off on somebody else, and he's like, and he just keeps drilling down on you. This is the human condition, and you ought to think about this more than you do. If we are sinful, parenthesis, and we are, if we are sinful, and we are, and one of the consequences of our sin is that sin distorts our ability to see how sinful we are. See, this is the human condition. If we are sinful, and we are, and one of the consequences of our sin is that our sin distorts our ability to see our sin, which it does, then the Spirit of God, so to speak, would have to work overtime, not just with one or two, but with a dozen ways to show us our sin. And he does. He says, we've become like one who is unclean. In a, in a way, our sin stains everything. It stains our good deeds and our bad deeds. It stains our words. It stains our unspoken thoughts. It stains our motivations. It stains everything that we do. If, you, if, if your hands are dripping with paint, you are not going to touch anything and have that thing be unaffected by what's on you. That's what he's saying. Sin deceives and distorts. Sin makes us blind to our own blindness. Sin makes us unable to figure out our own inability to figure things out. And this is what it means to trust in your flesh. It means that you have lost your ability to know that you don't have the ability to figure things out. And so you trust your own flesh rather than the word of God. When he says that we become like one who is unclean, and then he says our righteous, gar our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. It, and I picture my, before I knew how to do laundry, <laughs> I was in a little league. I was in a little league and my uniform, of course, had white pants. And I just remember my mom saying, why don't they make all baseball pants green and brown? Because that's what they end up being. You kids slide in the grass, you slide in the dirt, and I'm supposed to make them white. <laughs> like, I picture that little baseball uniform. Not, that's not what we're meant to picture. In the Old Testament context, we're meant to picture leprosy or the, the ritual uncleanness of a nocturnal emission for the man of the menstrual cycle for the woman that, that caused the, the, need for, the, the need for ceremonial cleansing.
If you take Isaiah 64, 6 seriously, then you could actually introduce yourself to everyone that you meet. Hi, I'm Spencer. If you're around me long enough, I'm going to make you sick. Uh, I'm, I'm an unclean person. We all still are. And then he says, we fade like a leaf. That's meant to make us think of chaff, weightless leaf. Not the fruit, just the dry leaf that's blown away, tossed to and fro by every wind. Our vitality is drained away. We're not a strong green vine. We're a leaf that's brittle and so easily depleted. And so we're meant to confess and understand our sin. But then we get to, after six and those likes and confessing our sin and the lament in verse seven, there's nobody left who calls on the Lord and we're melting because of our iniquities. Verse eight, but now, verse eight, but now, but now, O oh Lord, you are our father. You're our father still. We deserve your rod. We deserve your wrath, but you are our father still. Trusting God as father and maker is, is where it's all at. Trusting God as the savior and the one who forgives our sin is where it's all at. We appeal to God that he is our father. He says in verse eight, now, O oh Lord, you are our father. That's meant to recall 63, 15 and 16. Look at just one chapter back. It might even be on the same page. Verse 15, look down from heaven and see from your holy and beautiful habitation, where is your zeal and your might, the stirring of your inner parts and your compassion? They're currently held back from us. Verse 16, but you are our father. Though Abraham doesn't know us and Israel doesn't acknowledge us. You, O oh Lord, are our father. The redeemer from of old is your name. We appeal to him that he's still our father. And then he, we say in verse eight, we're the clay and you're the potter. So here's the picture. God's the father, which means you are a child. God's the potter, which means you are the clay, which means that in prayer, we are asking God to rend the heavens and come down. We are asking God for things. But in prayer, we're the child. He's the father. We're the clay. He's the potter. We're the boat throwing a line to the shore. God is the shore. Prayer is not pulling God into doing everything we need and want him to do. Prayer is really pulling us toward who he is and what he has promised to do. We confess that we have been unprofitable, hardened, recalcitrant clay, but we pray to the master artist who can melt and make beautiful things out of nothings. And we confess that we've been foolish and disobedient children who have soiled ourselves. But he's still our dad. And his love as our dad is not taken away by our dirtiness or our disobedience. Just as the prodigal arose and ran to his father, so we run to God. Perseverance in prayer. Perseverance in prayer is repentance. Power in prayer is repentance. There's no, there's no other way. This is the great turnaround. And just, I, I want you to treasure that verse eight, that contrast of, but now, O Lord, you are our father. This is the great turnaround. Verses six and seven is our sinfulness and that we don't deserve it. Our sinfulness, we don't deserve your blessing. But Lord, verse eight, you're our father and you've promised to bless us. Perhaps the rain made you a little late for service this morning or maybe you 
burned your Pop-Tart and you had to remake it and for whatever reason you got here three minutes late and you missed the call to worship, but the call to worship had that but now, O oh Lord, in it because the call to worship was Ephesians 2. We were in the foolishness and the lustfulness of the depravity of our mind, dead in transgressions and sins, but God, being rich in mercy, caused his great love to be, a, to, to be given to us in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's another one, isn't there, in Romans 3, verse 21. In Romans 3, it says, none's righteous, no one understands, no one seeks for God. We've all turned aside, we've all become worthless, but now the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bore witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all who believe, there's no distinction. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God but all can be justified by the free gift of righteousness in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, Romans 3, 10 through that final paragraph there in, in verse 26 is the New Testament equivalent of that which began here in Isaiah. Chapter 64, verses 6 and 7 about our sinfulness and then the turnaround in verse 8, but now, O Lord, you are still our Father. I love that the power and the perseverance in prayer comes from verses six and seven, confessing your sin. And then verse eight, clinging to what you know to be true about God. Is prayer difficult or is prayer easy? Prayer, I don't know if you believe this, but I believe this. Prayer will become easy if you regularly confess your sin and you regularly remember, really remember what is true about God. Prayer will be always difficult if you refuse to confess your sin and you don't really remember what is true about God. This is, makes the difference in perseverance and power in prayer. And I love how verse eight, but now, O Lord, you are our father. I wonder if that contrastive, but now, I wonder if it's not so much directed upward, like, but God, do something else, as it is, have you ever done this? Talk to yourself while you're praying. He's confessing his sin, and he's sorry about his sin, and he's confessing his sin, but he says, but now, I'm not gonna get stuck as if the last thing that I ever say is about how sinful I am, though that is true. But now, I'm gonna turn to God and I know that God is a father who forgives sin. But now, sometimes in prayer, you have to command your own soul, don't you? Sometimes in prayer, you have to say the truth about God even if you don't feel it. Is prayer difficult or easy? Well, in a way, prayer is difficult. Because to pray properly, you have to not be led by your own emotions. And it is difficult to refuse your own emotions. Your feelings are powerful and your feelings matter. Your feelings matter because they're your feelings. They, they relate something true about your perceptions at least, or maybe even true really about reality in your life. And so they matter. But you can't be ruled by them. Sometimes you have to speak to yourself and say, but now I know this. This is what I feel. This is what I feel, but this is what I know. Can I show you this? We could show you this in almost any of the Psalms. Just flip, just for a second, to uh, Psalm 101. I could, I could just about randomly open to the Psalms and show you a place where the psalmist is instructing his moods rather than being led around by his moods, where the psalmist is speaking to his own heart. It's the difference between talking to yourself like a crazy guy on the Manhattan subway, and he talks to himself because he's crazy. When the psalmist talks to himself, he is actually leading himself out of the insanity of being led around by human moods and into the sanity of being led about by God and what we know to be true. So look how much he talks to himself. Uh, Psalm 101 verse 1. 
I will sing. Who's he saying that to? He's saying that to himself. Self, you have to start singing of the steadfast love and justice of the Lord. Look at verse two. I will ponder the way that is blameless. Sometimes you have to tell your mind, mind, you got to quit pondering that and instead you have to ponder this. We have to. Uh, 102, Psalm 102. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. He says to himself, I got I to gotta cry out to God. And even if I don't feel it, I'm asking God to hear my prayer. Look at Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul. All that is within me, bless his holy name. I take that as a self-inflicted imperative. Hey, soul, start blessing the Lord. I will bless the Lord. My soul will bless the Lord. Verse two, bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities and heals all your diseases. And he goes on and on and on. What do I feel? What's going on? But what do I know? What do I know? Sometimes you have to command your soul to bless the Lord. Sometimes you have to command your soul to confess your sin and to bless the Lord. This is what we do to strengthen our prayer lives. I, I just feel an increasing burden when I teach about prayer to, to try to give you a, a couple of things to do this week to improve your prayer life because I think the easiest thing is to make you feel bad that you're not praying the right way. I think the more difficult thing to do is to help you take some steps to pray the right way. So here's uh, super quick, five quick ideas to help your prayer life. All five of these have helped me. Uh, the numbers match one, two, three, four, five, except the first number one is uh, 10. One is 10. What I mean by that is this, 10 thank yous, and 10 please helps. 10 thank yous and 10 please helps. I've been doing this lately. I wake up in the morning and I'm a little fuzzy. And so what I do to start my prayer life is I take a blank piece of paper and I write a thing down the middle, a line down the middle, and I, and I sit down, I think, okay, I'm gonna thank God for 10 things. And I write them down like as fast as I can, like so messy that I can't even read my own. I'm like, I'm not really thinking and pondering. I'm just like, I'm going to thank God for 10 things. And I thank him for 10 things real quick. And then, on, and then as soon as I'm done with that, on the other side, what are 10 things that I'm keyed up about? And so it's 10 I need help with. And I write those down as quick as I can. And then after I've written them down real quick, then I slow down and I turn that into sort of a, a longer prayer. So 10 thanks and 10 needs. Number two of quick ideas. Two is simply this, two people. You need to be accountable to somebody about your prayer life. There's a, there's a concept. And maybe what you do is pray, ask, tell, you both agree you want to improve your prayer life and say, well, let's pray together in the morning on the phone if you don't live together or whatever. And then in the evening, let's just text each other, you know, how, did, did you pray this evening? But you get that accountability because it keeps you going. Three is another habit that I, I acquired a long time ago. I don't always do it, but it, it helps me when I do is have that three times a day prayer, morning and evening and at noon, at, morning and at noon and at evening morning and at noon and at evening. He says that in the Psalms many times. Maybe you need to set an alarm on your phone to begin with to remember to do this, but to say, if you prayed for 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes at lunchtime and 10 minutes in the evening, I'm telling you that lunchtime prayer for me, that really helps me because believe it or not, I get burdens laying on me between the hours of 7 a.m. and noon. And that little prayer time at noon, it just helps me not to go into the back half of the day, like weighed down. So try to pray in the morning and at noon and in the evening. Four is just get some good resources that help you with prayer. And I can uh, name four of them real quick, though there's so many. Uh, the first two would be like, get a collection of prayers that sort of you can use as a script. There's one called a uh, Piercing Heaven, like Piercing Heaven with an arrow. Piercing Heaven is a wonderful collection that came out three or four years ago, a little collection of prayers. There's another one that's title is the name of the, the hymn, Be Thou My Vision. It's called A Liturgy for Daily Worship by Jonathan Gibson. And it's like a, it's a 
more formal liturgy, but there's multiple of them in there that you can use for your own quiet time. And then uh, a couple of my favorite books on prayer, just a simple book on prayer is that one by Paul Miller. Lots of you have read it. We've used it in many of our small groups. It's just called A Praying Life by Paul Miller. Wonderful, simple book that'll help you. And then one that I like, it's an oldie. It's a, it's a little book. It's like, a, it's like a, a, only like 112 pages. It's called The Hidden Life of Prayer. The Hidden Life of Prayer by a Scottish author named David McIntyre. I think I gave it to our elders uh, many years ago. I gave a copy to each of them. It's a wonderful little book on prayer, The Hidden Life of Prayer. And then uh, five, uh, and the, the last quick tip on how to improve your prayer life is read five Psalms, read five Psalms, start with the day of the month and then add 30 and add 30 and add 30 and add 30 and you'll always get through the whole book of the Psalms. And when I do that, I never fail to find something in there that helps me. But to return to this prayer in Isaiah 64 that swings from God's promise to bless, God's promise to judge, to the end of the book in 65 and 66, it takes us all the way through. If you'll look with me again at verses 9 through 12, be not so terribly angry, O Lord. Remember not iniquity forever. Look on your people. We've become a wilderness. The house that our fathers worshiped in is is burned with fire. And then we're pleading with God in verse 12, will you restrain yourself, O Lord? Will you keep silent and afflict us? We're bringing our needs and our hardships to the Lord. We're bringing our needs and our hardships to the Lord. Is prayer easy or hard? Prayer's easy because it's easy to bring our hardships to the Lord. That's like, there's... They're like, I'll teach you two words for prayer and then three words. for. The, this is a little three-word prayer. Right now, me. That's an easy prayer. Right now, my back hurts. God, help me. Right now, I have to call back so-and-so and I always fight with so-and-so. Right now, this. That's a pretty easy prayer. Right now, me. That's a pretty easy prayer. Help me with this. Help me with that. That's relatively easy. You know, a prayer that maybe is relatively hard, but I think the more spiritually mature you become, the the easier it becomes to pray this. Instead of those three words right now, me, what about these two words? Forever you. Forever you. When the disciples asked Jesus, how do we pray? Perhaps the most important thing Jesus said, pray this way. Our Father in heaven, your kingdom come, your will be done. Perhaps spiritual maturity is being able to take all the right now me and and understand as his child that forever you, forever you is a part of that and it's caught up into that. Perhaps prayer is easy when we know that we're needy and we know that God's kingdom is worthy. Perhaps prayer is hard when we're proud and we refuse to admit our need. Or perhaps prayer is hard when we're so myopic that we never get off of the right now me to have our gaze lifted to the forever you you should pray about everything. If it matters to you, it matters to God right now. And he, he, he actually commands you in 1 Peter 5 to cast everything that you're anxious about upon him. He wants to hear that. The right, I'm, I'm not saying don't do the right now me. Do that throughout the day. And somewhere in there throughout it as you weave it in and out of it is your kingdom, your will. God, I'm clay, your potter. I'm toddler, you are father. You see, that's life, and that's hope, and that's vision and wisdom to help us to pray. Let's pray that God would bless his word to our hearts. Even now, Lord, would you bless the preaching of your word to change the way we think, to change the way we pray, to change the internal dialogue that nobody but self hears, and to change the prayers that are lifted up to heaven. 
Spirit of God, would you use the word of God to help us to grow for Jesus' glory? Amen.